If you would go ahead and pull out your Bibles, and like we said earlier, we'll be in Psalms. And this morning we're going to be in Psalm 103. So if you want to take just a minute to find that uh, in the Old Testament uh, while you're doing that, um, I want to say Happy Valentine's Day. And as I look out, some of you dudes look up wide-eyed and uh, surprised. It is Valentine's Day. Uh, so if you forgot, let me just tell you this. Let me give you some good advice. I'm going to pick up my red phone right here. I'm going to talk to Cupid. And he says, you better get it together. Like, you better make up some kind of excuse. You better lie. You better do something. But you better go to town. You better buy your wife, buy your girlfriend a present, and you better not show up back at home. I got some stuff back in my office I've collected over the last couple of years from the lost and found. If you need to come and look through it, get some kind of present and take it to her or you're going to be in trouble. I'm just telling you that. All right, so it is Valentine's Day. Dudes, we don't need to mess this up. I do have one Valentine's joke as we get started while you're getting to Psalm. This is a great one. Um, what did one light bulb say to the other light bulb on Valentine's Day? Anybody know? Anybody know out there online that y'all know? I love you a whole lot. <laughs> right? Okay, here we go. All right, now it's time to get to God's Word. Let's get in the Bible, okay? Uh, we're starting a new series uh, this morning in Psalms, okay? And uh, we're looking at these ancient songs uh, from God's Word that were written. And we're going to see, uh, see, these things are just as relevant uh, now as they were then. And so we're going to see the message in it for us. I'm super excited about the Psalms. I really feel like this is where God wants us to go uh, as a church. And as we start, I think it's important like to not just say, hey, the Psalms are cool. I use those a lot of time for my quiet a lot of times for my quiet time. It's something that speaks to me. Like I, I think we really need to understand what they are. And I want you, not, not to read to you necessarily, but I want you to listen to this. This is one of the best descriptions of what the Psalms are. So just, just real quickly for about a minute here, listen to this. It says, in the Psalms we find words that express the deepest longings of our hearts, the aching of our souls when we experience loss, the exuberant joy of knowing ourselves forgiven, and the deep gratitude of God's amazing grace. Are you thankful for God's grace this morning, church? God's people have sung, recited, memorized, and shared the Psalms for thousands of years. The Psalms are central in the lives of God's people. The Psalms are songs of praise, songs of thanksgiving, songs of lament and wisdom and blessing and more. They provide us with models for our own spiritual lives. When pain has robbed us of words and meaning, the Psalms provide us with words to scream to God for help and solace. When joy has filled our hearts so thoroughly, the Psalms help us express our gratitude and our praise to God, who is the fountain of all goodness. Do you believe that this morning, church? However, the Psalms, listen to this, however, the Psalms do not give us step-by-step -step instructions for how to pray and how to give praise to God. Instead, the Psalms show us how to praise and pray. As the 4th century theologian Athanasius famously wrote, most of Scripture, listen to this, speaks to us. The Psalms speak for us. The Psalms are filled with teachings about God, about who God is, and how He relates to His people and to the nations. In their teachings, the Psalms anticipate and prefigure the coming of God's promised Messiah, the one who would bring justice and righteousness to the world. The book of Psalms can transform our minds by teaching us new and exciting things about our awesome God. It can transform our hearts by giving us words to understand strong and complex feelings. And it can transform our spirits by pointing us to the right way to praise God through our words and through our actions. And so this morning as we begin to look at this, we see that the Psalms are central to the lives of God's people and to the church. This morning we're going to be in Psalm 103. We're going to look at verses 6 through 18. And... In this, and here's, here's the title of the message today, and I think you'll see it as we go. When we understand God better, we begin to understand us better. Now, we're going to start off with just, because this is the first message, we're going to start off with just a little bit of a biblical vocabulary lesson. It's a, a little bit of Greek and a little bit of Hebrew right here. So, as we look at this, I want you to understand that the English word Psalms comes from the title that is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now understand the Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language 
And the, and the Greek translation of that in the Old Testament is called the Septuagint. So on your outline, uh, we'll put this up here as well. The Greek translation of the Old Testament, remember it was written in Hebrew. Now we see that most of the New Testament is in Greek. And so the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that's called the Septuagint. You're like, okay, cool. All right, it goes a little bit deeper. All right, so if you look in your Bibles right now, you, you, this is the next thing. In the English Bible, we see the word Psalms. Okay, so that's what we're studying. We're studying Psalms. All right, in the Septuagint that we just talked about, that's where we get that word. In the Greek translation of Septuagint, you see the word Psalmos. Okay? Now, if you translate that word back, go to the original word in the Hebrew, it's the word mismor. Okay? And you're like, okay, cool. We're getting, we're getting a theology lesson here. Right? The Hebrew title of the book is called, of this book that we're studying in Psalms, is called Tehillim, which means praises. So I say all that to say this. You're like, thanks for the awesome lesson. I think it's fair for us to say this morning that Psalms is a biblical book of songs and praises to God. That, that is exactly what it is. Now, we'll put this up here. There are 150 psalms. Uh, psalms has several uh, authors in its collection. Most, uh, the, the person that wrote most of the psalms or, or has written more psalms than anybody, wrote more psalms than anybody else was King David. David wrote 73 of them. There was Asaph who wrote 12. The sons of Korah are credited with 11 of them. Solomon wrote two. Uh, and then we see that there were various others who wrote one or so, and then some were unnamed. Um, this, and listen to this. This is kind of interesting. You're kind of getting a history lesson here. The Psalms were not just penned in one little short period of time. They were collected over a long period of time, pretty much from the time of David, which, like I said, we see a lot of the Psalms from him, about, uh, about 1000 B.C., up to the time of the prophet Ezra, which was in 450 BC. So they were written over the course of about 550 years. And in the time, this is kind of interesting, in the time that the Psalms were written, most people could not read. Uh, so the Psalms were central in worship in the temple. They were sung. Okay, so most of the people couldn't read. Um, they were sung in the temple. And so that's why we see, uh, that's why we see, and we talk a lot about these being songs, okay? They speak to God's people. They bring glory to God and they were used in the temple. We put this uh, sentence up here. I think it'll kind of help us understand. The Psalms show us that trusting in God's goodness and faithfulness, listen to this, even in times of suffering and grief, even when stuff is hard, a lot, a lot what, like what Harris talked about before we sang that third song, leads people to a new vision and understanding of life at the other side of suffering, which is a life of praise. In other words, we go through the temporary struggles, the problems in life, the things that we're not always guarded from, but on the other side, for the, for the people who are redeemed, who know Christ, who are God's people, there is a life of praise because of what God's done in our lives. So we get into this. On, on Wednesday night, I was talking with the, the, the group that gathered in here for the, for the Bible study that, we're, uh, that, that I'm teaching on Wednesday nights. And, uh, and I told them, I said, we're kicking off Psalms on Sunday. And I went ahead and told them, and, and they probably already knew, but there are 150 Psalms. And, you know, we just spent a year walking through the book of Romans. Um, so I figured it up. That means with 150 Psalms and about 52 weeks, in a year, that means, and we're taking off a few uh, breaks here and there, we're shooting for being in the Psalms until 2025, okay? Um, that's what, I'm just kidding, we're not going to do that. And I thought, man, that ain't going to work. <laughs> we're not going to be in it for that. Um, in, in all seriousness, here's my heart. I feel like this is where God wants us to be. I believe God's going to do a great work in His church through this. I think there's going to be conviction in it. I think there's going to be challenge in it. I think there's going to be redemption in it. I think that there's going to be encouragement in it. I think God's going to use it in a great way. And so my heart is that we're going to do this until God says do something different. So is it two months? Is it six months? Is it two? I, I don't know. But I think this is where God wants us. And I know that there's a reason. I know this for sure. I know there's a reason for where God has us today. And my prayer and my hope is that it, that it changes us. It changes the way we view God. It changes the way we worship God. And so that's my prayer, that God uses these special times in the Psalms in a great 
way. And like I said, we're going to talk about understanding God better this morning so that we can understand us better. And I think as we look at Psalm 103, 6 through 18, we're going to discover, I'm just going to be honest, that we don't know God as well as we could. And, and here's my proposal. When we understand God better, and, and which, by the way, we'll never completely do, because much of God is a, is a mystery, right? When we understand God better, we'll understand ourselves better. Look at this. We'll, we'll put this on the screen. When we make efforts to understand God better, when we understand His his attributes and His character and His ways, then we will understand ourselves better. Let's look at Psalm 103, 6 through 18. That scripture says this. It says, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious. That's where we say amen, church. Aren't you glad that God is merciful and gracious? He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will He keep His anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children... So the Lord shows compassion to those who fear Him. For He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like, are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. Listen to this. It says, verse 17 and 18, But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. And His righteousness to the children's children to those who keep His covenant and remember to do His commandments. Now, I'm going to be real honest with you. Part of what really drew me to this Scripture this week was verse 14. And it makes sense as you look at verse 14. How can knowing God better help us know ourselves better? I think it's because we have to understand that God knows us better than we know us. We'll put that on the screen. But God knows us better than we know us. And so the better we know God, the better we know us because He knows all about us. He made us. I'm reminded of Psalm 103, 14. Look at this verse. For He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Right? I mean, we pull that out and, that, and that's the key to it. He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. It, it was just a little reminder to me this week that God knows us better than we know ourselves. And it says to me that God's perspective is different than ours. I'm reminded this morning, and you may remember this scripture, I'm reminded of what the prophet Isaiah penned. He penned these words of God. And this is what God said. Listen, in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, he said, God said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Here's the reality check this morning, church. Listen to me real close. I, I know I do, and I bet you do too. We know our shortcomings, don't we? We know our failures. And we know our good qualities too. Like we know when we do it right, and we know when we have good successes that, that, are, that are honoring to God. And maybe we get to this point sometimes where we think we know ourselves pretty well. But if Scripture is true, and if what God's saying is true this morning, and I believe it is, then we have to know that God knows us better than we know our own selves. I'm reminded of Luke 12, verse 7. Look at this, which says, Even the, head, the hairs on your head are numbered. God knows that about us. Or how about Psalm 139, 16, that says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. And in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. God knows us better than we know ourselves. God made us. He knows us better than we could ever know ourselves. But here's the thing. And this is what really hit me. And I want you to think about it this morning too. If that's true, if, if He knows us better than we know ourselves, then why do we get this? Why do we care more about what 
we think about ourselves or what other people think about us? Why do we tend to care about that more rather than caring about what God thinks about us and what God knows about us? Have you ever really wondered what God thinks about you? Have you ever really just thought about, thought about what God thinks about you? Look at this. One of, our, one of our greatest barriers to knowing God better may be how much we know about how much God knows about us. It's a little wordy, but think about it. One of our greatest barriers to knowing God better may be how much we know about how much God knows about us. We struggle with God sometimes because we, we feel so bad about ourselves. And, and we know the, the truth about ourselves. But think about how much more God knows. Here's the deal. We can never fool God. We can, ne we can never pull one over on God. We can't hide anything from God. He's all-knowing. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. God knows everything. You, listen, you think you're sinful and you fall short? God knows you're sinful and God knows you fall short. Sometimes we don't want to pray or read the Bible or think about God because we look in the mirror and we feel like saying, I'm a big disappointment or I ought to be doing better by now. And we think God can never really love us or God's just sitting up there pointing a finger and He's, and he's disappointed in us. We've all felt that way from time to time. And, and I imagine maybe just in this room this morning or watching online, maybe some of you are at that place right now and you feel that way. You, you, you feel like, like I'm a disappointment or I can't add up or things are go, all, everything's going wrong in life and I don't know what to do. And, and, and maybe it's been a hard week. Maybe it's been a terrible month. Maybe it's been a rotten year and you feel defeated and lousy and spiritually tanked and it's a struggle. And, and I think at times because of that we run from God rather than run to Him because we know our own hearts too well. And yet, we know His heart barely at all. And in, and in that, listen, here's what we do. Listen to me real close. God's people, many times, even though we know the, the redemption and salvation of Jesus Christ, it's easy to get caught up in, in all the stuff. And we forget the fact that God is all-knowing, that God is all-sufficient, that God, that God never had a maker, that God always was, God always will be, that God is totally over all of creation. We don't realize He knows us better than we know us. And that the better we know Christ, the better we know Him, then the better we'll begin to understand ourselves. The more we'll understand what life is really supposed to be about and how to actually live it and what we're supposed to be doing. Listen, I, I don't have to spend any time this morning convincing myself and I, and I don't have to, to spend any time convincing you because we, we say it just about every week. Look, we don't play games with God's Word. We are all sinners falling short of the glory of God. And, 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 and I know this is the truth about me, and I bet you know it's the truth about you. But I think it's, uh, and, and we know that about our own hearts, whether we're re willing to admit it or not. But here's the problem. I don't think we know God's heart very well. And, and that's where Psalm 103, I think, helps us tremendously. If you're wondering what God thinks about you, if you don't get anything else this morning, then, then this passage shows us um, some things that I think will help minister to us this morning. We, we discover through this passage of Scripture, we begin to understand some characters and some traits of God that help us understand Him better. And when we can look at it through His lenses, we understand ourselves better. I love Psalm 103 because we begin to discover how deep and wide and long is the love of God for us. And we need that sometimes. Sometimes, don't, don't you agree, sometimes we just need that encouragement. We need to be reminded of the attributes of God. We need to be reminded of what God has done for us. It, it, re, it reminds me of what Paul encouraged the church at Ephesus with. This, this is what he told the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. He said, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, listen to this, what is the breadth and the length and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's what this passage in Psalm 103 does. 
It's kind of the nuts and bolts of that. The breadth and the length and the height and the depth of God's love for us. In our scripture today, I'm just telling you, we're about to go through it real quick. Um, we're going to see some incredibly liberating truths about God's love for us. So I hope, this is my hope, this is simply it, that if you need to be encouraged today, that you just need a little encouragement that this ministers to you like it did me this week. So we're going to keep it real simple. If we're going to gain spiritual maturity, if we're going to know ourselves better and know what we should be doing, then we got to understand God better. So, some things that maybe we just aren't seeing sometimes about God. So what does this passage this morning? This is kind of the note-taking part. This is the kind of to take home and chew on it this week and just let God minister to you through this. What does this passage say about God? Well, let's step back through it just a little bit. If you've got your Bibles there, number one, I want you to see this. In verses 6 and 7, we saw that He helps those who are in need. He helps those in need. Remember that scripture said the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made His ways known to Moses, His deeds to the people of Israel. Listen, we always have to remember that Jesus did not come for those who are well, did He? In fact, there was no one who was well. Jesus came for the sick. Jesus came for the needy. We are all needy. We're all lost without Christ. He came for people who can't, never could, never will be able to help ourselves. In the Old Testament, now, this word particularly referred to widows and orphans and foreigners and the poor. All through the Scripture, we see that when people were, take, were, were tempted to take advantage of other people um, because they are strong and others were weak, God says, uh-uh, no way, don't, don't do that. And, and we live in days where it's hard to believe, especially in light of all the craziness in our world. We, we, we begin to see those kind of things. We, we live... Listen, y'all don't bring the house down with a big old amen, but listen, we live in days in a, in a society that's out of whack, isn't it? Yeah. Greed pushes everything. And, and we want to think, where is the justice? Where, where is the justice in a nation that's riddled with sin, with abortion and homosexuality and hatred and lying and cheating and the list to just go on and on and on? But this truth right here that we see this morning that we see in, in, these, in these verses in 103, it stands like a solid rock for the believer. If all of history is a book, we haven't reached the final chapter yet, but we know this much. Eventually, listen to me, church, God will bring everything to life. And He will stand as the judge of all time. In, in that day, there will be, the Scripture tells us, there will be no hiding, no excuse making, no bribes, no way of escape. And we have to answer this. Every one of us stand before the Lord and we have to answer this question. Are you needy? And we should all be the first ones to raise our hands and say, yes, we are and we needed Jesus. The, the, the answer is, is yes, whether you know it or not. Being needy is not just reserved for, for the sick and, and the poor and, and for widows and orphans. We're, we're needy. If you're needy. I'm needy because we are sinners and we need God. And the greatest news is that God helps those who are in need. What I mean by that is, is that you and me, we're needy in, in the sense that without Christ, we have no hope. We need a Savior. Listen to me, if you're listening online, and maybe there's some folks that, that don't know Christ who are listening this morning. We need a Savior more than we need anything else. And those who know Him, we can be thankful that we saw our need and, and God provided salvation for us even though we didn't deserve it, right? He, he could, here's the deal. He could have left us out to dry. Our sin calls for death and for us to be cut off from God for eternity. But thank God this morning He made a way. For those who call upon His name and believe, He saves. He helps those in need. But you have to see your need. You have to know you're needy. Some people know themselves pretty well, but not well enough. They don't see their need. They don't look deep enough to see that the one thing that they need more than anything else is a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. People tend to trade off their lives for all kinds of things when what they really need and the only thing they need is Jesus. He's the answer. He always was the answer. He was the answer as the Scriptures were penned, and he is, he is the answer now, and He will be the answer for eternity. 
He helps the needy. God, God knows you need Him. But the question is, is, do you know you need Him? Secondly, verse 8 shows us that He shows mercy. We kind of already touched on it. He shows mercy even though we don't deserve it. He shows mercy even though we don't deserve it. Verse 8 said, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. You know, in that verse, in, in verse 8, there are four amazing attributes of God that we find in that one verse. First of all, it tells us that the Lord is compassionate. In other words, He's merciful. He pardons us. It shows us that the Lord is gracious. He gives us what we don't deserve, a gift that we didn't earn, that we could never repay. You could never give God a gift back that would be big enough to repay what He's done. It says that the Lord is slow to anger. That means He's patient with us. And He knows that we are fallen. And he, he knows that we've fallen short of His glory. And He's slow to anger over that. And then it tells us that He abounds in love. He abounds in love. Listen, I'm going to tell you this morning, you, and, and maybe you're sitting here and you don't feel loved. You wonder, does anybody love me? I'm just going to tell you this morning, God loves you more than you could ever imagine. You can't fathom how much God loves you. You just can't do it. He loves you more than, you, than you'll ever know. There's no love like God's love. When He saves, listen to me, He saves completely. When He forgives, He forgives all your sins. When He sets you free, you are free indeed. You are free forever. Nothing can take you from the hands of God if you are truly His. The, the, the King James Version of this Scripture translates the phrase that we find in verse 8 by saying that God is plenteous in mercy. He's shown us mercy even though we didn't deserve it, and He's given us plenty. We sinned. We turned our backs on God. Our sin made Him have to go to the cross. But He decided to rise up so that we could be raised up. He is merciful. We don't know how to show mercy like God does. We can forgive, but God forgives bigger. We can learn from that. And we have to ask ourselves, can we forgive in the way that God forgives? We're commanded to if we know Him. He forgives in the manner in which we forgive. Here's the third thing this morning. Notice in verses 9 and 10 that He tempers His wrath. He tempers His wrath. It says He will not always accuse, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Are you thankful, church? He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. You ever, you ever heard the saying, you get what you pay for? Y'all ever heard that? I, I've used this example before, I know, because I remember telling the story, and I don't remember what sermon it was in or whatever, but it was the only example I could think of. But several, several years ago, I ordered one of those, and y'all may remember these, y'all remember the gator wrench that they had on the Home Shopping Network? I'm just going to tell you, it's a piece of junk. All right? And, and I was convinced for 1999 I was going to get the best wrench that the world has ever seen. It would fit, it would fit any nut, bolt, anything. It's all I ever needed. In life. But what they should have said, what they should have said on the commercial was for $19.99, we're going to send you a piece of junk and you're not going to get your money back and you're going to get what you pay for. But listen, I'm going to tell you, if, I mean, you, you, couldn't, open, you couldn't open a cereal box with that wrench. I mean, it's awful. Listen, I got what I paid for, but with God, listen to me, if you are saved, listen to me. I got what I paid for with that gator wrench, but with God, if you're saved, we get what He paid for. We get what He paid for. Have you, have you ever known somebody that loved to argue? Don't, don't look at me. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm just kidding. Have y'all ever known somebody that loved to argue? We all know people who love to keep a quarrel going, don't we? It's, it's like with that guy or that lady, it's like it's their job. It, it, they, they like to argue so much, like you want to you want to see their tax form, like like you getting paid to do this, right? Because they argue so much. Listen, they, but God's not like that. The scripture here tells us that he he was willing to end the quarrel with humanity and welcome his children back home. Sometimes the problem though is we want to keep fighting with him. When I read this in Psalm 103, I'm reminded, I was reminded of the story of the prodigal son. He's the one that turned on his father. He, he's the one that requested his inheritance early. He's the one that ran off. He's the one that squandered the inheritance. But it was his father who welcomed him back. 
home. Listen, God's more ready to forgive than we are ready to be forgiven. Think, think about how God has chosen to temper His wrath. Think about this. God could have just said, I've had enough and ended it all. But I'm going to tell you, we're in a day of grace. God is in saving mode right now. His wrath is tempered right now. We're in a day of grace. Now, it will come to an end one day. It will end, and that will be it. But now, listen to me. God saves lost people all the time. People all over the world are being saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. God is sovereign, and God changes hearts every day. And you may be here this morning, or you may be watching online, and you may be saying, you know, I don't know if this Christianity thing is for me. This joker up here talking about God's Word and the Bible, you know, I don't know if I want to listen to this. I'm not sure if, I don't know if I want to do this Christian thing. But I'm just telling you, if you're listening and you're hearing, God's not through with you yet. You're, you're here, aren't you? You're listening, aren't you? God's working on you right now. We're living in a day of grace now where people can and do get saved. I'm reminded of, here we go with Romans again. Romans 2 4. God's kindness leads you toward repentance. God loves you. And He's tempered His wrath for a little while. One day He will judge, the Bible says He will judge the quick and the dead. But today, today is the day of salvation, the day of grace. And I would just say to you, if God's tugging at your heart, come to Jesus while you can. Verses 11 and 12 show us this. Here's the fourth thing. That when God forgives, when God saves somebody, He forgives all our sins. Verse 11 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the love for those who fear Him. And verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. That's one of the most well-known verses in all the Bible. Verse 12 is, As far as the east is from the west. And we'll throw that one out there. We'll stick it on our refrigerator. We'll put it on a bumper sticker. And I love that verse. But I wonder if we've really thought about the depth of that as far as the east is from the west. This, this makes us consider the greatness of God, His vastness, His awesome wonder. It makes us consider the greatness of God's love. I mean, think about it. We live in a tiny corner of the universe. And second, the universe is vast beyond our comprehension. But God's love is greater and more vast and larger and deeper and longer and broader and bigger than any of that. Because He created it. I mean, you could, you could get in a rocket and you, that's equipped with all sort of sci-fi you know, technology or whatever. You could fly at warp speed if you liked. You could go as far as you can go to the end of the known universe and beyond. And when you've gone as far as you can go, you can look up and smile because God's love is still going. You'll never reach the end of it. His love is not billions or trillions or like we used to say, well, you know, the biggest number, Googleplex. I mean, that's not, that's not God. God's love is infinity and beyond, right? Thanks for the Toy Story reference, right? To be, I mean, it, it is more than we can fathom. I mean, consider the magnitude, the magnitude of it. But let's suppose that you wanted to go east until you could finally reach the west. So you take off from, from New York City. New York City, right? From Alabama, right? take off from New York and you cross the Atlantic Ocean and you cross Europe and you cross Asia and you cross the Pacific and finally you make it back to California and you're weird out for a few minutes while you're there. And then you make your way back to New York. Besides having circumnavigated the globe, what have you, what have you proven? Once you've, once, one, you've proven that you have a lot of vacation days, right, to be able to do that, or that you are retired and have made a really good living and you have the time and the money to do it, or that you have a bunch of money and you just don't really have to work, right? Some of the people say, get a job like a preacher, work on Sundays and Wednesdays, right? Whatever. But you got time to do it, okay? I mean, because who else would be able to take off and, and, and go all the way around the world? But seriously, if you, if you traveled the globe like that, then you've proven that no matter how far... How far east you go, you never found the west, right? The farther east you go, the farther you are from the west. That's the magnitude of God's love. That's, that's great news for sinners. When God forgives, He removes our sins. He lifts them up. He, he takes them away to never be found again. This amazing thing about God is that God can forget. He chooses to remember them no more. We don't necessarily have that capacity. But, but God does. 
He chooses to remember them no more. He, he hides them behind the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and if He didn't do that, then He would be admitting that He's not God and that He's weak and that Jesus' blood wasn't good enough. The, the hard part is that we remember our sins. We often don't forgive ourselves or we listen to lies from Satan or we believe that we'll never be good enough. Surely God couldn't forgive you and we kind of give up. But you know what? We won't ever be good enough. We, we can't be. God chooses to forgive those who repent and come to Him through the grace of Jesus Christ. And He gives us a gift that we couldn't pay for. He paid for it. He provided it. He forgives because He loves us. The fifth thing. Verse 13, He understands our weakness. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. You know, being a dad helps me understand this a lot better. I can remember with all three of my children when they were younger, I remember times I would sing to them to go to sleep. I would sing and sing and sing to those kids. And, and my line of thought was, well... You know, I've done this at that time. I used to sing in church a lot, and I've done this a lot of times, and I sang in church a lot of times at church, and people fell asleep, so I figured if I sing to my kids, surely they'll fall asleep, right? And, uh, and you know, I, I get it. Some smart aleck out there saying, well, you, ought to, you should have tried preaching them one of your sermons. They would have really fallen asleep. But seriously, I would make songs up and sing Scripture. And I had other Murph originals, too, that I would never admit in public, but... Um, the, the, and my kids are going to hate me when I get home, but I, I, one of the songs I made up, and they would go to sleep to it, is this famous little ditty I did called Riding on a Choo Choo. And, uh, and I just made the tune up, and, and, and I'm telling you that, that, I'm just saying that it was Daddy's song. It was the song they needed to go to sleep when they were little. And I, I learned that early on. That, that, and here's the deal, listen. And I'm just saying that to say this. When it comes to parenting, um, earthly fathers, whether... However imperfect they are, listen to me, point us, should point us toward the Heavenly Father. And, and that, was my, that was my main motivation with all my failures and shortcomings and, 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 and whatever it may be. I, I wanted to be a good dad for my kids because, I, because somebody showed me that early on and taught me that, 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 that the way I lived my life would, would point my kids toward Christ or, or not. And that I wouldn't be perfect, but hopefully they'd see a perfect Savior through me. And I'll just say this, when an earthly father has done his job well, he makes it easy for his children to believe in the Heavenly Father. Our children, what I'm saying is our children learn that we do not worship, listen to me, that, that we do not worship a God of stone or an empty idol or some remote deity or an impersonal machine in the sky when they see a real relationship with Christ. And let's think about God as our Heavenly Father. We serve a Father, God, who knows our weaknesses and knows our frailties and knows our shortcomings and, get this, loves us anyway. God, God knows our weaknesses and understands our fears. And when we can't go on, He carries us on His back. We need to trust Him. We need to believe that, that He wants us to lean into Him and to count on Him. Verses 14 through 16 show us the sixth thing this morning. And again, this points toward the sovereignty of God. He remembers that we are dust. You're like, That's the weirdest point you said all morning. He remembers that we are dust. That we're created and He's not. For He knows how we are formed. The Scripture says He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. He remembers that we are dust. I know it sounds a little bit weird, but it shows us that God knows something that is very important that maybe that we maybe we don't remember sometimes. Because sometimes we want to act as though you know that, that we're invincible or whatever it may be. But God's eternal. Sometimes we don't think about the shortness of this life and, and, and how few these days are. And, and get this, we often don't think about the fact that what we do here determines our eternity. So many people will trade off eternity for the here and now. Listen, life's short. We've got one shot at it. One shot at it. Think about it like this. I mean, we're in the middle of winter right now. And, and, and boy, I, I mean, I've lived in Alabama all my life. And I'm just telling you whether 
whether what goes what they're saying is about to go down in the next couple of days goes down or whether we just get a few raindrops this baby's about to shut down for two for two or three days right everybody's headed everybody's headed to Publix and Walmart as soon as we dismiss the ones watching online say I've got a little advantage I'm gonna cut it off early and I'm gonna beat you there all the bread's gonna be gone all the milk's gonna be, and people gonna go crazy right and maybe it's warranted and maybe not but I'm just telling you we live in Alabama and this is like the, this is like the, you know they make fun of us for a lot of things for living in Alabama, but this is it. Like, like they're going they, those people that down there are going crazy just because it, you know we're, we'll cancel school for anything. I'm just telling you, and uh, it, it is going to happen. Um, but listen, um, we're in the middle of winter right now, right? And and, and this is the unchanging law of nature that, that green leaves of spring and summer end up in a pile in your lawn in the fall, right? Why do leaves lose their green? There, there's a specific there's a, there's a specific scientific explanation having to do with the loss of green chlorophyll. And I would be I, I'm a doctor, but I'm I don't I don't know that kind of stuff, right? Uh, I mean, but I'm just telling you that's what happens, which simply means that the leaves are slowly dying. Their beauty in the fall comes from their death. You get that? Their beauty, the colors in the fall come from their death. One by one, the leaves fall to the ground where they disintegrate and return to the soil from which they came. It's the way of nature, the way God arranged the changing of the seasons. Um, just a few years ago, it's Valentine's, so I got to pick on my wife one time. Just a few years ago, she began to, she doesn't do it much anymore because it's just who I am now, she began to tease me a little bit about, you got a little bit of gray in your beard. You got a little bit of gray on you, coming up in your in your hair. You got a little bit of gray. And then, here's the problem. Other people began to tease me. Started coming to church and it wasn't, hey Murph, how you doing this week? Man, you guys, man, you're getting gray. Started, started getting my first old man jokes. Um, somebody asked me how my grandkids were in the, in the Burger King drive through You know, um, you know, four or five years ago, body parts started, stopped working. And uh, all that. When, when God puts gray in your beard, it's like the leaves is turning brown in the fall. It's God's way of saying, you, you're not going to be here forever, right? Now listen, I hope to live to be an old man. That's my prayer. I'm not into cemetery humor just yet. That's what I'm saying. But I'm just saying, I'm reminded, and I hope you are too, this life is a blink, isn't it? You, you only get one sharp shot at this part of it. And how you live this part of it determines the rest of it. And the amazing thing about God is that He created us to exist for eternity. We'll either do it with Him or we'll do it apart from Him, but it will be an eternity. If, if there was no more to this life than the time that we spend here on this earth, then this may be a simple way to put it, but what's the point? If that's all there is, if we're here today and gone tomorrow, if that's the end of the story, then there isn't any hope. But let me share something with you. If you don't have anything else to be thankful for today, here's something you can hang your hat on. Our hope is not in man or anything that man can do. Our hope is in the everlasting God. He remembers that we are dust and that this earthly body will, will die. We may act like we think we're going to live forever, uh, here or that we're invincible or maybe we'll put God off and we'll say I'll just you know I'm going to get a few things straightened out and get my life together and then I'm going to trust in Jesus I'm just telling you you're not guaranteed another second we are but dust the time to get right with God is now when this life on earth ends then we enter into eternity with him or separated from him one or the other last thing verses 17 and 18 show us the seventh thing. He links us with eternity by linking us with Himself. To be with Him, listen to me, you got to know Him. Verse 17 says, But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear Him, and His righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep His covenant and remember to obey His precepts. Listen, there's nothing we can do about our frailty. We come from the hand of our Creator. God is God and we are His created human beings. Try as we may, we can't cancel our humanity. Nothing can change what we are. Vitamins and exercise and clean living, those are good things. 
And, and we, we ought to, you know, we ought to do those things. Maybe it slows down the process, whatever. But, but for all of us, the end is the same. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. He's God, we are not. There's something pretty awesome in verse 17, though. And I want you to see it. It's the very first word, and it's the word but. B-U-T, in verse 17, the word but changes everything. That, that one word offers an eternal contrast between the dying leaf and the everlasting God. Between our mortality and God's eternity. That one word but tells us that we can go from this life to the next and be with Christ for eternity. That's the real hope that never ends. Someone said this. I don't know who said it, but it's an incredible quote. We'll put this on the screen. Listen to this. Life without Christ is a hopeless end, but life with Christ is an endless hope. This, this endless hope, the Scripture tells us, is not only to us, but to our children's children. It's something. That, it's a heritage we pass down. It's a, it's a story we share. It's a life that we live in front of people who need to know and see the Gospel. Money, Inheritance, stock options, stock options, whatever, they're all well and good, but, but whatever we may say about our earthly possessions, we won't take them with us. They are pale next to the privilege of passing down a godly heritage and a tapestry of truth and a pattern of believing to our children and our grandchildren that they can claim as their own. Listen, we're in a quickly passing world where everything fades away. And we have the promise that we are linked to the future, even after we're gone, through faith in Jesus Christ. God knows better than we know that how we live this life matters because it determines our eternity. And it affects our kids and their kids one day. What does God know better than we know about ourselves? In a nutshell this morning, I would say uh, that what Psalm 103 is telling us is that and if we really take it in today, it's this, that we are richer than we think, they, that, we are, that we are more blessed than we know, and that we have more than we realize in Christ. We are frail, mortal sinners, but we are rich in the mercy of God. Amen? All that we believe, all that we have, all that we hope for is found, listen to me, in the cross of Jesus Christ. Go to the cross. If you're looking for your way home, go to the cross and you'll find your way home. Are, are you weak this morning? I, I, I thought about it this week. Are you weak? So am I. Are, are you needy? I, I am too. Are you guilty? I admit it. Falling short of the glory of God. And you have too. Are you frail? We are. Are you like dust? The Scripture says we are and we better believe it. God says to us as weak, needy, guilty, frail, dusty children, I know you through and through. I know you better than you know yourself. And I love you anyway. He says, come to me. All you are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come to me. Rest in me. Make me your hope. Maybe we need to see it the way God sees it. See us the way God sees us. Know that we are His creations. The people He loves. The people He desires to save. God's mercy in Christ is more than enough for all of us. If you want to know you better, if you want to know you better, then know Him better. Do you know it this morning? Listen, before we leave this morning, I've asked Josh Swindle, our student pastor, or our elders here at church, just to come and lead us in prayer, offer a time of invitation and response, and to close out for us. Um, again, let's take this scripture to heart. When we know God better, then we begin to know ourselves better. Josh, would you close us? I think the challenge for us all is to ask ourselves the question, what are we doing to know God better? What are we doing? Have you ever trusted Him? If not, maybe today's your day uh, to admit your sin or believe in Jesus and commit your life to follow Him. Uh, for those of us who do know Him, what are we doing to better know Him daily? So let's let that be our heart's desire as we close this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us. We thank you for this time that we've been able to fellowship and to worship and to grow um, in, in our knowledge of you. And God, uh, I, my prayer for my life is that that knowledge would turn into action. God, that we would take 
what we know and God apply it in, in the lives that we live. God, to the people that we know, to the ones that we meet. God, to who you bring in our path. God, may they see Jesus in us. And I pray for this church that, that we would be your hands and your feet outside this building. Um, God, that we would take the gospel God, to those who need it, to be encouraged by it, to be changed through it, uh, and God, to, be, to live in eternity because of it. So God, use us for your honor and your glory, and may all that we seek to do make much of the name of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.